Hallelujah. I pray that on this blessed day of the Lord, God will give us and bless us with the word of life, his grace, his blessings, and answers to our prayers. Today, with the title, John the Baptist and Elijah, I'd like for us to think about the transitions of the times, transitions in our faith. Last week, we have studied about the faith. And as we were thinking about the faith, we talked about how God reckons righteous those who have faith. That righteousness is not innate in us. We are not born with that righteousness. Rather, we are born sinners. And that righteousness needs to be given to us by God. And in order for that to happen, we need to come and submit in the form of repentance, give up our sins. We have to realize that we are sinners. We have to come to Jesus Christ for that forgiveness of sins. And then he, his righteousness is given unto us. And that I call transition of our faith. That transition is the greatest transition that needs to take place in order for us to receive salvation. And, and that mystery is hidden in the task and ministry of John the Baptist. And so we want to think about the task of John the Baptist in light of Elijah's course of transfiguration. Remember, Elijah was one of the two Old Testament figures that, was, that were transfigured, taken up to heaven without seeing death. Especially Elijah's life and his ministry foreshadows. It's almost like a type of the end time saints in the process of and the path that we need to take towards transfiguration. In the end, when Jesus comes, those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, will be resurrected to heaven to meet with Jesus. And those who are still alive will be taken up and meet him in the air when he comes with the sound of the trumpets on the clouds. And this is written in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And so the reason why we are studying about John the Baptist is because Malachi, the last prophet in the Old Testament, prophesied that before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, which is referring to the coming of the Messiah, there will come Elijah. Elijah will come back. Elijah, who was taken up to heaven, is going to come back as a sign, as uh, to share the word, to prepare the hearts of the people to be returned to the Father, and also to prepare the way of the Lord, just as we have read in today's main passages. And so, because John the Baptist is prophesied by Malachi and testified by the angels in today's passage, and also testified by Jesus later in, in the gospel, that he is the Elijah that was to come. And so, what is their relationship? And more importantly, why did God say Elijah would come and John the Baptist came? And what is his task? What is the message that we need to understand in this mystery? So today, let us think about John the Baptist and Elijah briefly. And think about the transition from sin to righteousness. Because unless that transition takes place, we cannot look forward to resurrection or transfiguration. So this is the first step that we need to take before we can look forward to resurrection and transfiguration. So let us think about what the Bible tells us about John the Baptist. So first point, Elijah who was to come again. Elijah was prophesied that he would come again, that he would be sent again. Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. So Elijah is supposed to come and 
Make reconciliation between father and children. Make the reconciliation spiritually between father in heaven and his children. So that there will not be judgment falling upon the people. So that he may not have to smite the land with a curse. And then Luke chapter 1 verse 17 we read in today's main passage. I'll read it again. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. So this is the angel speaking to John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, and prophesying about what he will do. And it said, he said, the angel said, he will be a forerunner going before him, the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah. And then repeats and quotes the prophecy of Malachi to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the gratitude of the righteous, so, that, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Malachi came. God sent Malachi as the prophet to check if the people are ready to receive the Lord, receive the Messiah. The covenanted seed, the seed of the woman, finally about to come. And are the people ready? And throughout the book of Malachi, we see people profaning the Sabbath, not keeping the Sabbath holy, uh, rather profaning the temple. And so God says, I wish there, was, there would be somebody who would shut the gates of the temple so that you don't have to come and give me this defiled and lame sacrifices. And then he speaks about how they are robbing God of thanksgiving and tithe. So in all aspects of worship and serving the Lord and living a life of faith, they failed. And so he says, then I will send another prophet, Elijah, to prepare these people who are not ready right now. To prepare them so that they can be ready to receive the Lord. So the Israelites had this great expectation that the prophet Elijah that was taken up in a whirlwind, chariots of fire, will come back down and prepare the way of the Lord. How do you think they waited for Elijah? Which way did they look to wait for Elijah? Remember when Jesus said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, on the cross, they said, maybe he's calling for Elijah from heaven. They expected Elijah to come down from heaven because he went up on the clouds or fire, chariots of fire upward into the sky. They expected him to come down from the sky. But let us think about who this is. It says, spirit and power of Elijah. And what, what, why the spirit and power? When do you need the spirit and power? It is when you have to fulfill the task that God has given. And so the, he, he received the spirit of, and power of Elijah to fulfill the task of Elijah. This is like the code word, giving a hint about who John the Baptist is. And so let us think about Jesus' testimony about John the Baptist. And this is something that Jesus said, and therefore it should be clear to us. Matthew 11, 13 and 14. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So he says, all the prophets and the law are until John. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. He says, John, well, John referring to John the Baptist, he says, John was Elijah who was to come. Matthew chapter 17 Verses 10 through 13, he says it again. And his disciples asked him, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Jesus said, because you did not recognize Elijah, you will not recognize the Son of Man. 
Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And that's when the, the disciples finally realized Jesus is speaking about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is the prophesied Elijah that is to come again. So let us think about why God prophesied. Because in Christianity, we don't believe in reincarnation. It's not a reincarnated Elijah whose name was John the Baptist. We have to think more spiritually about the signs of Elijah and John the Baptist. Elijah, John the Baptist who came, but Elijah who was transfigured up to heaven, take, who, who they, whom they saw going up to heaven, and it's recorded in the Bible that he went up to heaven. And now the prophecy is he will come back. And he came back, but he did not come back from the sky. He was born to Zacharias and Elizabeth. He was born as a baby. He grew up. And he's fulfilling what is prophesied in regards to Elijah who is coming back. So as a second main point, let us think about the task of John the Baptist who came as Elijah. First, the task is the task of turning the heart of the father to the children and the heart of the children to the father. Reconciliation, spiritual reconciliation. Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6 we read earlier. And so he is to become a bridge that connects people back to the father through repentance. And then a bridge that will connect the people to the Messiah. And that's why he said about himself in John chapter 1 verse 23. This is the second task. Voice of one crying in the wilderness. When people came to ask him, are you, are you the Messiah? He said, no. Are you the prophet? He said, no. Are you Elijah? He said, no. But he gave a secret message so that those who truly seek and understand from the word can understand and find out. And he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. John chapter 1 verse 23, he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. He gave enough hint. And Isaiah said this in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. Again, I'll read it for you. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. And so he is a voice, but according to the Hebrew language, and this is expressed in Psalm 19 verse 4, this word voice can be translated as line. Like a bridge, line connects. It's a line that connects from one end to the other. From the people to the Father, from the people to the Messiah. So he is the one, he is the voice, he is the line in the wilderness. A place of sojourning, a place of training. Remember the days of Israel in the wilderness? So he is the voice that leads them. And this voice says, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. So this, if you listen to this voice, you will know when and where the Lord is coming. And John the Baptist did testify according to John chapter 1, verse 19 and the following. He testified about Jesus. Jesus came to be baptized by him. And he said, he said the most spiritual thing obvious testimony about who Jesus is. So John the Baptist cried out the truth in the wilderness. He did cry out in the Judean wilderness. He preached in the Judean wilderness. The message of repentance and the message of the coming of the Messiah. Two main messages. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That, was the, that is the summary of his message. Repent. Realize you are a sinner. Because, and have hope. Because 
the, the kingdom of heaven, who is the Messiah, is at hand, at the reach of our hand. Literally, Jesus was amongst them, standing right there. But this message, these two messages, repent, repentance is a message of the law in the Old Testament. And that He's coming is the message of the prophets in the Old Testament. And therefore, just as Jesus said, up to Him, until John, the prophets and the law were spoken. But John is the one that puts that to end and introduces the Messiah. Why? Because the law and the prophets both point to the Messiah. The purpose of the law and the prophets in the Old Testament is to prepare the people to receive Jesus, prepare the heart of the people, to cultivate the heart of the people to receive the seed that was promised. And so John the Baptist comes and gives those two messages. And so the third task of John is to become the end of the law and the prophets. To draw a border saying, this is the end of the Old Testament. This is the beginning of the New Testament. This is the end of the law. End of the law doesn't mean, just as Jesus said, it doesn't mean abolishing the law. It means graduating from the law into a higher level. So Matthew chapter 11, verse 13, as we read earlier, this is Jesus speaking. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And Luke chapter 16, verse 16, Luke 16, 16 also says, The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached. And everyone is forcing his way into it. The time is it's the time, time to graduate and transition from the law and the prophets to the gospel. Because the gospel, the truth, the word is here. I pray that this transition will take place if it hasn't already in our life also. There needs to be that transition from condemnation to righteousness. The door to grace, righteousness, forgiveness is being opened up. That's why this baptism is very important. His baptism graduates people from the law and opens the, new, uh, do, opens the path and the door to the new world of Jesus Christ, the gospel. I'm not differentiating and contrasting the Old Testament law and the gospel. The gospel is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. The gospel is the answer to the law. And so people were waiting. The, the law told the Israelites and to, tells us, you are a sinner. Because you did not keep this, you did not keep this, you did not keep this, you are a sinner. And when you are a sinner, you have to die and go to hell. And then the hopeful message is, but fear not. When the Lord comes, when the Messiah comes, this regime of sin and death will be defeated and He will reign over with life and hope, eternal life. That's why they waited for the Messiah. That's why the prophets prophesied, wait, just wait a little more. The Messiah is coming. And the last one that cried out that message is John the Baptist. And he says, the kingdom of God is at hand, is here. May you and I also believe that the kingdom of God is here now and today. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. And so they are to bring their sins, the law of the Old Testament that condemns them, come to John and be baptized with it. And baptism is dying of our old selves. 
And when you resurrect, when you come up from baptism, all of that is gone. Your homework, you submit to the teacher. Old Testament homework is submitted to John the Baptist. And from there, he gives a certificate saying, now you can graduate and go into Jesus Christ. Go meet the one who will give you life. It was as simple as that. Just receive baptism of forgiveness and come and meet Jesus. But people did not believe it because it was too easy. Fourth task is the task of preparing the way of the Lord. Meaning leading people to understand who Jesus is. That Jesus is Christ, the Messiah. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Here, it make, Mark makes it simple and clear. There was a prophecy that God will send His messenger ahead of the Messiah, who will prepare the way. And He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make His path straight. And then John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus came to this world to turn sinners into righteous through His righteousness. He came to give us that righteousness. But we need to come to Him and receive forgiveness of our sins first. And, then, and so John the Baptist was the process. He was, he was the one that offered that forgiveness, repentance and forgiveness. And as soon as they meet Jesus, all their sins will be wiped away. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He's the one that saves people, his people from their sins. John the Baptist is the one who leads them to Jesus. Remember when even during the ministry of Jesus, when he was healing somebody, rather than just saying, get up and go, he said, your sins are forgiven. To Jesus, that was the more important, the most important matter. Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, but go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So we need to first give up all our sins through baptism and receive his righteousness as a gift. I believe and pray that all of us have received that righteousness. And as we read earlier, Mark chapter 1 verse 4, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of forgiveness, of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This baptism represents resurrection. Verses 7 and 8, Mark chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming, who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so John the Baptist becomes a bridge for people to come to Jesus. And this was radical because in the Old Testament times, they had to bring animals and go through the complex process of sacrifice and offering in order for their sins to be covered. But this was too easy. Just come and be baptized and your sins are gone. Because baptism, through baptism, you meet Jesus Christ. That's, that was John the Baptist's task. Leading people to Jesus Christ. Preparing the way of the Lord. Now, let us think about what that all means by going back and thinking about Elijah's journey of life and ministry. So that is the third main point. There's an important message that God gave through Elijah's life and his ministry. 
And he wanted to use that message to apply to the people of the New Testament and to us. And John the Baptist is the one that brought that message to fulfill it. So let us briefly think about Elijah's life. Let's outline it. And I will talk a little bit about the first part. First background about the times of Elijah. It was during the time of King Ahab who foreshadows Antichrist. The most, one of the most wicked and evil kings. It was the time of spiritual withering, dryness, and famine. And it was also a time, uh, uh, the time of Jezebel, who foreshadows the great harlot of Babylon in Revelation. Fullness of idolatry and fallenness. The stages of Elijah's journey can be described briefly as Brook Kerith. God tells Elijah to go to Brook Kerith. And then after that, he is sent to the home of the widow of Zarephath, a Gentile region. And then from there, he goes to the final battle at Mount Carmel. And then after that, he takes on this journey. And there was different parts of this journey, but I call it the path of transfiguration. He goes to the, the wilderness, he, he flees, and he comes to God and asks him, please put an end to my life at the broom tree. And then he is led by God to Mount Horeb. From there, there he hears the still small voice of God and instruction of what he needs to do. And then final stretch to different places, but in the end, transfiguration. This also lays out a similar outline, just as we have studied last, this past Wednesday, of the path of transfiguration that we need to take in the end. And it's the path that God wanted to deliver and wanted His people of Israel to also understand and take when Jesus came. So today, let us think briefly about the first place, nourishing at Brook Kerith. It was a hiding place for him. First, it was a hiding place. First Kings chapter 17, verse 3. Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the Brook Kerith, which is east of the Jordan. So he is to go into this wilderness and to this place called Brook Kerith, where there was water. And God said, I will send ravens to bring you food. This is where Elijah was to find hiding place, find rest and nourishing. When there was, God had said there will be no rain, no rain. And there will be famine. But during this time, Elijah was fed. Elijah was nourished. He was being prepared for something, for the next step. It was a place where my old self has to die completely. It was a place where my old self, myself, my ego, my old sins, my stubbornness is all crushed, melted down, and disintegrated. Because kerith means to cut, to divide, to split, to chop up. So he is, he is being nurtured and nourished. As I shared a little bit this past Wednesday, he was given food by raven. Raven is supposed to be unclean animal, unclean birds. But Reverend Abraham Park, in his old sermon, said, Ravens are also birds of filial piety, meaning birds that know how to honor their parents. And he said, even though they are considered unclean animals, they are like tutors. And Apostle Paul referred to the Old Testament, the law, as a tutor in Galatians. 
So when we think about the entire process from the fall of Adam, all the way to the coming of Jesus, and all the way to the end time of today, after the fall, these sinners, God needs to restore and redeem. And so God works through them and gives the law to teach them, to train them, one by one, little by little. And that law is to prepare, for, prepare them for the covenant that God has given. And that covenant is fulfilled through the truth that came in the flesh, incarnation. Incarnate means in the flesh. The word, the truth, the promise, the seed in the flesh, Jesus Christ. When He comes, all these things that were like tutors to prepare, just like tutors that we call it tuition here, right? Tutors who prepare students for PSLE or for ent college entrance exam, for O level, N level. After the exam is done and taken well and scored well, you don't need the tutor anymore. You go on to the next level of schooling. Likewise, the Old Testament was given as elementary principles to tutor them, to prepare them, to graduate into Jesus Christ, the, the gospel, the truth, the true word that came. And so it, this, the place of Brook Kerith represents that stage for Elijah. It's a place of training and learning. Water and bread that was provided for him at Brook Kerith represent Holy Spirit and the Word. And the wilderness. And Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, Jesus told us that man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. John chapter 6 verse 51, I am the living bread. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12, Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Little by little, the ravens, uh, when we, if, if we think only literally, not uh, taking, uh, putting aside the spiritual meaning, if the ravens were to bring food with those little beaks, how much bread? You cannot bring the whole loaf of bread. It would be broken bread, little by little. Many forefathers of faith had to go through this stage. You and I, I believe that we need to, if we have not already, have to go through this stage. Adam was given all kinds of trees to eat from in the garden. Noah, the process of building the ark. See, after God's calling, God always takes His people through this time of training. Time, it might be a time of agony and hardship, but it's a time of tra training. Training meaning there's something real that is to come. And so it's a time of preparation, time of learning, time of growth. And so Noah, the process of building the ark. Abraham, after God's calling, life of journey, of following God's calling, and obedience and separating from his worldly attachments. Jacob, his 20 years at Laban's house, laboring under this wicked man. And so Laban was like Raven, right? Laboring under this wicked man, although he was his uncle, Laban used wickedness and deception. But under that, Jacob trained and nourished and grew in faith. He was, that was a time, that was like the time of wilderness for Jacob. It was a time when he needed to throw away his human wit, his human stubbornness, his, the sinfulness that he was born with. And so we know Jacob's story. After that, he, he's, he's on his way back home and he receives a new name from Jacob, which means heel or heel grabber, to Israel, the victor. There needs to be a change in this process. 
Joseph, Potiphar's house, and the prison in Egypt before he became the prime minister. Moses, 40 years in the Midian wilderness. He thought he can start the work right away as the prince of Egypt. But God sends him to the Midian wilderness and waits as though God has forgotten for 40 long years before God calls him to use him to do his work. When we think it's late, God says it's time to start. Because that's how long it took probably for God to take out Egypt from Moses. Just as the 40 years in the wilderness was a time to take out Egypt from the Israelites. Same thing, the Israelites, 40 years in the wilderness. Apostle Paul, after the conversion, after he received Jesus at, on the road to Damascus, the three years in Arabia, Galatians chapter 1, verses 17 through 20. And as a result of the, tw- the three years in Arabia, he says, Now it is not I who live in me, but it is Christ who lives in me. That change has taken place. And for the saints of the end time, it's represented by Apostle John and the following contents in Revelation. Apostle John receives the little book and he eats it. And then he is to prophesy again. And he goes through the time of prophesying and then the battle with the beast and he's defeated. And there's a waiting time until the resurrection and taken up to heaven. That is a short, brief outline of what is to happen. And then chapter 12, it speaks about the woman clothed with the sun. And this Revelation chapter 12 is speaking about the first three and a half years. Where she is taken to the wilderness to be nourished. And then chapter 13, we see the beast coming up. And then the second three and a half years of the seven year tribulation begins. As conclusion, there is need for transition from the law to the love of Jesus Christ through John the Baptist. As we have seen, the Old Testament time under the law and the prophets was a time of preparation, time of getting ready for the coming Messiah, for the truth, the seed, the promise, and the covenant that is to be fulfilled. But people were stuck with this law. Although they did not keep it correctly, they were stuck with this law. And so there needed to be a transition, letting go of that law and grabbing hold of the gospel. The fall is all about broken relationship. After Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God said, Adam, where are you? Adam said, I'm hiding. This is a broken relationship with God. Second, God said, why are you hiding? He said, I'm naked. I see my own shame. This is a broken broken relationship with myself. Third, God said, why did you eat of that tree? And he said, she made me eat it. This is a broken relationship with each other. And they were sent out of the Garden of Eden. Broken relationship with the creation. In order to fix the relationship, redemption is about redeeming relationships. And that's why they were not waiting for a time or waiting for anything else. They were waiting for someone to get into relationship. And that someone is the seed of the woman, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. In order to fix the relationship, God gave the covenant. The covenant is of the Messiah. And then he gave the law, like a guardrail. You know, when you go over a bridge, if there is no guardrail on the side, you might have a little bit different attitude about crossing that bridge. But because there's a guardrail, there's safety. The law and the prophets were like the guardrail. 
to make sure that they stay in this track of the covenant. As I mentioned earlier, Apostle Paul called it a tutor. Galatians chapter 3 verses 24 and 25. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. See, last week we, we talked about the, the faith. And then the conclusion was, that faith is the faith of Jesus Christ that needs to come into us. When we invite Jesus into us, that He brings that faith into us. It is not our faith, it is the faith of Jesus that makes us righteous. Right? And here, Apostle Paul says, But now that faith has come. So the tutor, the law, is our tutor that leads us to that faith, Christ, Jesus. And that faith has come and we no longer, we are no longer under that tutor. So far, they've been fed in the Old Testament. We've been fed the Word of God. And how are we going to fulfill, keep the Word of God? How, are we, how will that Word that came into me change me? And how am, I, how am I going to live that life? If the Israelites were trained in the wilderness, how are they going to conquer and live in the land of Canaan accordingly? If Abraham had been trained through the separations that took place, how will he obey finally the final test when he was told to sacrifice Isaac? Apostle Paul explains it this way. When he was writing to the church of Corinth in the Corinthians, he speaks about the sexual prostitution. The church and the people during that time thought it was okay to get involved and, and get into that activity, hiring prostitution. But Apostle Paul says, but Apostle Paul explains the reason, the reason why they must not do it. But it's not of proposition, meaning it's not like the, he's, he's not presenting the law, you shall not do it because the Bible says so. But he's saying, don't you remember? It's not, I'm not speaking about the commandment that, that prohibits you, but don't you remember? You died with Jesus Christ on the cross, and you're sharing His resurrection life. Jesus isn't Jesus in you. Where you go, you're going with Jesus. Isn't the faith of Jesus in you? Do you want Jesus to submit to that kind of activity? Do you want to bring Jesus and have Jesus treat those women like that? You have Jesus living in you. You're sharing your life, or actually you're sharing His life, because in you, there's no more of your life, but it's His life, right? Do you want to subject them to that? It's not the law of Christ, but the love relationship with Christ in us that compels us to do things and constrains us, refrains us from doing things. It's a relational code, not an ethical code. It's the love, not the law. Like Joseph having to finally forgive his brothers. Saints of the end time, rejecting the seal of the beast. See, Joseph forgiving his brothers is not because of the law, but it's because of love. This is the transition that needs to take place from law to love. The reason why we continue our life of faith, it should not be because of fear factor that we might be judged it should not be from guilty guilt factor. It should be from love factor. For those of you who are married, why are you faithful to your spouse? Is it because of the vow that you took at the marriage, at the wedding? Try to tell your wife, I'm being faithful because just because of the vow I made at the wedding. See how well it goes. It should be because of love, true love. Not because of any kind of law or consequences. That's what needed to take place when Jesus came. 
But what did people do? Rather, they killed Jesus with that law. They used that law to condemn Jesus. They used that law. When Jesus, was, Jesus came to them with love, they rejected him with the law. The law that was supposed to prepare them, they did not use it properly. They turned it around. John the Baptist, once again, was to be the end of the law. So people could receive the true love and restoration through the relationship with Jesus. They are to go higher and higher through their relationship with Jesus. Through that redemption of relationship. And once that relationship with God takes place, the broken relationship with myself, with each other, with the nature, with the creation, everything will be redeemed. But that first restoration did not take place. That's why Jesus says, now I will come back. But I leave you with this word and the Holy Spirit. And through this word, through this Holy Spirit, practice love. Fulfill love in your life. Then when I come, then when I come, I will take you through resurrection and transfiguration. May you and I be able to take this path, transition from law to love. May your reason for living a life of Christian, may your reason for following Jesus Christ be love. Love of Christ in us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this time to think about our faith, your righteousness that you are giving to us, and the great transition that needs to take place in our life of faith. Father, may we be able to grow. May we be able to graduate to the next level of faith, where love is the real reason. Love of Christ is the real power and motivation and reason for our life. Father, throughout this week, help us to experience your love. Help us to practice our love towards you and for others. Father, may your name be glorified in our life. And help us to truly experience power and miraculous work by living a life of love. Thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give thanks to God.